Hello everybody, welcome to What Would Your Idea Well Be, a new podcast which examines many important people and the important things in their lives, what they think about most of the current trends at the moment, what they think about certain subject matters, and of course, what their ideal world would be. Lee Hardcastle is an adult stop motion animation filmmaker with a massive following, raking up over a million subscribers on YouTube alone. His combination of stop motion filmmaking, extreme violence and nostalgia for many of the cult movie classes of the 80s and 90s, has earned many admirers, including some of those he has paid tribute to, like the Raid director Gareth Evans and famed filmmaker John Carpenter. He was also a music artist like Gunship and Sufjan Stevens for their music videos. Anyway, thank you for okay, coming on. Uh, the first question I wanted to ask you was that um, what um, movie, if you don't mind me asking, you inspired you to make films in general? What was the film that inspired you to make other films, pretty much, to make the stuff you're doing now? I find these questions really difficult to answer now because, um, I mean, I've been doing this gig professionally full time for about 11 years now. And um, I've answered these questions before, like 11 years ago, and I've seen my responses on the internet and (laughs) I feel like I've got amnesia because I'm just like, whoa, is that what I really said? (laughs) Was that really my response? So why it's difficult to answer is because over the years, you know, a lot of things change, you know, just like how your music tastes change and what have you. But specific to your question, let me try and remember what it was that, to be honest with you, I don't think it was a film in particular that, uh got me got me excited about making films and what have you it was um the tv show t- well, general tv shows where things were quite diy mm-hmm. like uh you've Je- you, jeremy beadles you've been framed mm-hmm. which was just like people catching catching accidents on the video cameras and this is like you know the early 90s and i'm I think I was just blown away that people had these camcorders and they were recording things and able to um, do really fun things with them. And then later on in life, I come across a lot. You know, like there's a lot of stuff on MTV as well in the mid nineties where it was very DIY, very punky. And you could see that it was done by an an individual rather than, uh, a company, you know what I mean, with the high production values and everything, and then and then uh, the Adam and Joe show uh, on on Channel Four. Um, they used to do a segment every time their to, to open up their TV program, and it'd be like a toy movie, and they'd do a parody of a movie with with their toys, and it was just so crude, but so creative and. And it were all those things that really sort of gave me that spark. Mm-hmm. And um, may I ask, if you don't mind, what is it like to be a stop motion filmmaker, like working in stop motion, especially given that that, that sort of style of filmmaking is essentially associated with more family friendly material, like say, like arm and stuff, or even like some more edgy stuff, like say, Leica over in the US, for example. Yeah, um, I really don't have any strong feelings towards what the medium is associated with because like I said I like I, I was born in 1985 and um I used to, I, I watched I grew up watching a lot of um satellite tv and there was a lot of uh stop motion animation that was for adults you know um on MTV and um and, and on, like you'd see it in various films as well, you know. Uh it, to name some very, very famous ones like The Terminator. I remember seeing the Terminator as a kid. And it didn't that didn't look real. I could see it was a stop motion puppet, like instantly. And it was really, you know, that's how I've always I, I'm not saying that's how I saw stop motion animation, but I've never made that association with animation being just kids TV, uh, just just this or whatever. Like, I've just seen it as another medium. And um, may I ask you, like, um, 
all, with all your work and so on and so forth, like, what has it been like for you to attend, say, award shows, which we discussed in the past, like, say, the Cannes Film Festival, which I know you screw one of your films, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, you talked about meeting your heroes, like Edgar Wright. How has that made you all feel that you've gone from sort of like a small time, if you don't mind me saying, YouTube channel, becoming this sort of big thing on the internet and beyond? How does that made you feel, if you don't mind me asking? <laughs> um, it's a very weird thing to reflect on. Um, because um, when when um, when things started to happen for me, when I was gaining a bit of a, attention to begin with, it was really rewarding. <clears throat> it was really quite. Um, I don't know what the word is for that. Just I just felt like I was achieving what I've always wanted to achieve. And I felt like I was going in the right direction with everything. Um, yeah, it was, it was pretty, it's pretty crazy because um, I, I, I don't come from like the most privileged background. You know, I was in the north of England and went to the Northern Film School. And it, it was really difficult to be a part of the industry when I left university and I kind of had a bit of a reality check and ended up sort of settling on a career in visual effects, potentially. Um, I got a job as a runner in a post-production house in, in London. So I moved to London and I was um, working for minimum wage for about three years. And in that three years, it was, it was very, it was a very testing part of my life because you know you're not you, you just kind of like you're not really earning the right lot of money you're not really sort of like got much of a lifestyle going for you and you're doing it purely because you're hoping one day it'll it'll uh, progress into bigger things and what have you um so I was really utilizing my time when I was in, in London and I was doing stop motion animation on the side just as a way for me to learn how to use VFX and be a lot more involved in, in, in what I was doing at work actually. And that <laughs> reflecting on those times and then finally having my own business and making commercials and things like that just feels really surreal. Just feels like such a world apart from each other. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's a bit crazy. It feels crazy. And uh, how do you also feel when you, when, for example, you've um, done tributes, homages to people that you've, all films that you've seen that you've really liked, like, how did it feel that you, those you riff on, like people like, say, Gareth Edward Evans, sorry, for example, from The Raid, or John Carpenter, give praise and support to your work on social media, for example, how does that, like you are so well known that these people are now getting in contact saying they actually like your work. Yes, yeah, it's, it's pretty nuts, pretty crazy. Um, I've, you know, I've, a lot of fanboys out there um, would like to would like to meet the heroes, wouldn't they? They would like to have an opportunity to, you know, even ask a question at Q and A. Q &A. Or even attend a Q and A session and see someone they admire talking about their lives and what have you. It's like there's something really, something really special about that. Just, just kind of like going to see like your favorite, favorite band live, and so to be recognized, or I wouldn't even say recognized, but just to have like interaction with these people that is like have have such a admiration for um yeah it's it's <laughs> it's it's fun it's fun um i don't i don't feel like oh you know we're gonna start hanging out together now or we're gonna start working on a project together it's just like well that's funny you know he's just, he's seen my little animation and he said something about it and yeah it's fun <laughs> it's fun 
And uh, what's it also been like? Because I know you've worked with several musicians, for example, on their music videos. What is that like? Because I know you've done that for quite a few musicians. What? How did you get sort of into that? Like, who were the first sort of people you worked with, and how's that sort of played out for you? If you don't mind me asking. Um, one of one, of, I guess some of the first music, some of the the first music videos I ever made was for my own band, actually called uh, Shit the Bed. It was a band that I was in as a teenager, and we recorded an EP about 2004. And I was just in a, I was in a bit of a mindset where I wanted to make loads of videos, like anything and everything. I just really wanted to make whatever. So I decided to make a music video for each one of our songs, no matter how lo-fi it was how low budget it was and um i sort of like got a few offers off of that like this was back in the days of using myspace this is before youtube even um so i did a couple of videos whenever the opportunity was there and i used to i used to do music videos for about 50 quid People would email me and say, would you make us a music video for £50? And I was like, well, I was quite amazed that somebody was reaching out to pay me. Um, so it was just like all, all those early days are really important because it was like the first steps to where I've become now. Um, you learn a lot from just making stuff. You learn a lot from being paid as well like someone pays you 50 pounds and then you give them a product and you sort of like get a lot of experience out of that and then um i feel like the first sort of real music <sighs> don't know like i saw it progress really slowly like it slowly became like 100 pounds and then somebody approached me with 300 pounds and then 10 years later it's like you know i've got record labels approaching me um and i don't i feel like my journey that's how it's worked for me my journey has been that slow progression to that point um uh, i don't know how it works for other people but that's how it's worked out for me mm -hmm. and uh also i know you've worked on a film a anthology film called the abcs of death if you don't want to bring that up what's it like to work with all these sort of like you know different filmmakers and uh on, and how do you feel about Looking at that project now, I think it's like 10 years ago nearly. Well, actually, um, I, wasn't, I wasn't asked to be a part of the project. What happened was I read about that project online and I read about like, all the filmmakers that were involved in it. And I thought, oh, wow, that's cool. And then they later announced a competition um, looking for the 26 film director. Um, so it was a public competition basically and um, it was open internationally and I really I was really really keen to be involved in the project um, I didn't know if I was I, did, I, I didn't know if I was being delusional or not but I was I really wanted to give it like all my best or my best effort um, because I felt like that was I felt like that was my strongest my my the strongest part of me as an artist was that I was really good at telling really short horror stories. Um, so I felt like if, I don't know, I just felt like the, the perfect competition for me. Um, so I entered Tears for Toilet and it actually won the contest and then became a part of the film. And so that was, that was a really that was a really big achievement, like a real good, massive, big achievement because when I sat, like, I've always wanted to be a film director, like since I was a teenager and my dream, my dream was just to have something that I'd made on a cinema screen and have that playing like all over the world. And when I won that contest, I, that's what, that's what happened. We had a premiere of the movie ABCs of Death at the TIFF Toronto. And I got to like 
experience the whole film festival thing and it, yeah it was it was amazing um i was i was about 26 years old um it's quite quite young to be sort of experiencing something like that um and you know i've not actually i've not actually achieved or experienced anything like that since um maybe i will do when i make my first film if it, if i ever do but um it's it's nice it puts a smile on my face when i think about the whole abc's of death thing and um yeah i'm really really quite proud of it all really quite mm-hmm. proud of it and uh one other thing i want to ask you is like what has it been like going to sort of those sort of festivals then because yeah and what's it been like and um yeah so what's it been like just essentially go to film festivals you don't mind me asking like that um the, i like i said i've i've never been like as privileged as some of the people are now. Um, so in my 20s, I was, as a teenager and in my 20s, like I never had any money, um, never never got to go traveling or anything like that. I've always had to work, 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 work for money, uh, work to save up for things, save up for this, save up for London, go to London. Uh, you get the idea. Um, and when um, the whole clear mission thing started to work out for me, I was getting I was getting invites from film festivals, like asking me to put on like a, a screening of all my films collectively and all this kind of thing, and do Q and As, and that really blew my mind. Absolutely blew me away. I was I couldn't believe it. Actually, I was. I was like, as I was weirded out by it at first. I was, I was, I was, I was, I couldn't believe it was happening. Mm-hmm. So the first festival I ever got invited to was one in Slovenia. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you go to these places, each one is like such a unique experience. I've been to about a dozen now, um, all over Europe and one in Toronto. And the people, it's amazing to meet all these people and the other uh, other people that are in, uh, that are working in film and and just people that are really enthusiastic about cinema and just and and all the culture that comes with it when you go to these places. So I was like finally finally getting a chance to go traveling and having the expenses paid for as well from the first from the festivals. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's worth being a filmmaker yeah. purely for purely for the whole film festival thing because the film festivals is such a nice, such a beautiful way to go traveling and and meet people and and feel welcome and not be a, not just not just be a tourist, you know. Uh, so we'll talk about film festivals and so on. Uh, who are like uh, the biggest names like you've met at these film festivals? Like who's you know who are the biggest names like you met at these festivals in terms of like either influence or just like people that you've been starstruck by meeting if you don't mind me asking oh um gosh there's i mean i've met quite a few people at these festivals um i'd i'd hate to name drop or or anything like that um is this it's just, I've I've met I've made friends. I'll talk. I've made I've made some pretty cool friends from the festivals that we've kept in touch with over the years. Um, I got to meet. Well, I'll, I'll t- I got to meet like most of the directors of the ABCs of death. <laughs> um, and they've all gone to do cool stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, a bit like notably like Adam Wingard. He's mm. Onto uh, King Kong versus Godzilla and all that. Mm. Um, I, I made a really good friend called Alex Shandon, like about ten years ago now. He made, he was there doing uh, doing the circuit with a film called Inbred. Um, and um, this other guy that I'm really good friends with, um, I met him at the Leeds Film Festival, and he. Because he ended up doing like voices for some of my animations and I did some claymation for his films. A guy called Dominic Brunt. He's not like super famous, but he's uh, pretty well known in, 
in England um, for being on a soap called Emmerdale. Oh yes, I've well I've heard of this soap. I haven't watched it in several years. <laughs> It's um, uh, it's been on this, it's been on this soap since the nineties, so it's like a very well established TV personality. But on the side, he's got like this career of making horror genre films. It's quite, it's quite, an, got quite an interesting career going on. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd hate to name drop basically. Um. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry for being um, anecdotal, but isn't inbred? I think I've heard of that one as well. The one set in South Yorkshire or whatever, where um, a bunch of them are. Uh, I can't remember what happened. Like the ending sort of like really dark and so on. And um, I forget another one you mean. It came out in 2011, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I think I've uh, seen that on the horror channel before. Yeah, they, they shot it around Fursk. All right. It's called Fursk, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, one other thing I want to ask you, sorry if this is a bit gossipy on the whole thing about ABCs of Death, and this will probably be the last question to ask you on it. Okay. If I'm not mistaken, one of the directors of the various films was the director of a Serbian film as well, if I'm not mistaken. Did you ever meet yeah. him, and what was he like, given what a Serbian film is like? I've seen it. You know what? Um, I didn't meet him, and I'd, I've never seen Serb- a Serbian film actually. I've I've read quite a lot about it, but I've never even seen it. Well, it's, it was, it's something. I'll just think well, of that, I guess. Yeah, it's it's you know I'm quite I'm quite interested in um, censorship and mm. and what have you, but um, yeah, Serbian film. I just don't feel like it's something that intrigues me enough to want to watch it. <laughs> well, you need a good stomach going in, but I don't think it's too bad for what it is. And being honest, for you know, it's very grim. If you're into that sort of thing, it might appeal to you, but I'm not sure. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, one other thing I wanted to ask you on that, leading on from the censorship thing, is that on YouTube, you've sometimes had like copyright come after you, mainly. I'm thinking of the whole Pingu's the thing, you know, incident whereby the owners of Pingu or whatever has came after you for. Supposedly using their characters, even though I'm pretty sure that's, you know, given that it was a homage, I'm not sure, that, you know, I'm pretty sure it didn't violate any laws in that case. How, how do you feel it's gotten better or worse on YouTube since, I don't know, the early 2010s, if you don't mind me asking? Um, YouTube is forever evolving, like from, from like every six months, it's, it's slow, it becomes a new place, and so it's a very different place to what it was ten years ago. Um, I don't, I don't really know what the law is exactly. It's just a bit of a free for all when it comes to YouTube. That's my experience. Mm-hmm. So it's a bit frustrating if you're wanting, if if you if if you're making the if it's your livelihood, mm-hmm. um, because there's there's no. The guidelines are constantly changing and they're sort of like a bit malleable. And so rather than I've I've tried to stick to YouTube and um, but fortunately for me, I don't it's not my main source of income. Um but when I make stuff for YouTube now, um I just hope for the best. I try and make something I I want to make and and hope it's sort of like doesn't get flagged or doesn't get taken down. And um, there's a couple of there's a couple of major rules um, you, that apply to your anim- to my animations if you want to sort of not get removed and whatever. And that's basically no sex and nudity. Mm. And the level of violence, I feel like you can get away with a certain level of it until it becomes a bit too torture porny mm. a, bit, a bit too much like torture porn then they get like super flagged like 18 plus mm-hmm. um so yeah youtube is it's still it's still in the it's still evolving it's still like going through changes and what have you and i feel like things are maybe getting better I really don't know. I'm not paying too much attention to it, but I feel like my videos aren't necessarily getting removed and age restricted as much these days. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I don't know if that's because I've sort of 
toned it down a little bit, perhaps. Mm-hmm. And uh, one other thing I wanted to ask you on that, you talked about pink. You know, well, I started, sorry, the thing about pink is the thing is that um, <laughs> okay. uh, you often pay homage to the thing on the YouTube channel, John Carpenter's the thing, and uh, you've cited it as your favorite horror film, if I'm not mistaken. Like, why specifically the thing above all others, if you don't mind me asking, if you don't mind? It was probably, it's probably like my first, one of my first horror films that I watched as a kid. Like, um, I must have been about eight years old. Um, I remember the first time I watched it, we rented out Stargate. It was like the latest rental that weekend. And Kurt Russell is in Stargate. And so after we finished watching Stargate, my family went to bed and me and my cousin sort of like flicked through the TV channels to see what else was on. And lo and behold, it's like halfway through The Thing. Um, we stopped to watch it because it had Kurt Russell in it. <laughs> like, oh, it's that Fair guy. Enough. And um, it's quite a slow burning film, but we, we sort of like caught it bang in the middle where all the exciting stuff is happening. And it really did blow my mind. It really, really, like, shook me to my car. Um, and for, like, for about half a year, because I started to record it, actually, as soon as we saw, like, all this crazy shit happening. So for half a year, I had half of the movie recorded. <laughs> and then eventually... I heard like so much about the opening sequence with the dog and everything, but I'd never actually got to see it until I bought it on video. So it became, it became an obsession before I even got to see the whole film. And then when I got, like I bought the film and it cost me about five pounds, but at a young age, that was a lot of money. And so when you buy stuff, you sort of try and make, Try and get your money's worth out of it. I don't know if that's just like the Yorkshire way of life. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I got this videotape and to sort of get my money's worth. Well, not only get my money's worth out of it, but just get, I was just really entertained by it as well. Like I'd literally just get home from school and put the thing on and watch it like almost every night. Um, I don't know. It's like just, just became like a real comfort film for me in a weird way. Mm-hmm. And uh, not, not as keen on Stargate, I take it, if you don't mind me asking. Yeah, I can't remember it. <laughs> I, don't, I could not tell you what happens in that film at all. I don't remember. I've never seen it, so I can't really comment. Did you see the new thing? Well, not necessarily new, 10 years ago, the prequel, remake, whatever it was, a decade ago that they made. Did you ever see that or this is something yeah, that passed yeah. you by? No, I saw it. Um, I was, I was, I was super intrigued by it. Obviously, um, I thought it was a great idea, and I didn't think it was a good film. But I thought, I felt it was really, really like I felt like it was quite educational to compare it with the thing and try and understand where how they were different and how it sort of fell fell flat i guess mm-hmm. and um one of the, one of the things that i speculated and really it really dawned on me was how the thing re- it, it's it's almost it's almost a western it's almost mm-hmm. a western film but like, there's just so much so much like standoff standoff sequences and like if you were to put that in a saloon like you'd have a cowboy film basically um and, I, and yeah i just found all that really intriguing to sort of like understand the genres that i was that was that I was um experiencing with the two different films mm-hmm. like the the prequel was a lot more actiony. It had a lot more action in it. It was more like, you know, getting chased down the corridors by these monsters, and 
it didn't have any weight to it. it didn't have any just it felt emotionless mm -hmm. there was no you didn't feel the stakes mm -hmm. of anything it just felt flat is the best way i can say it and with the the 1982 kurt russell one it just i don't know it's just so engaging and i feel like that it's, it's the, the acting i feel like it's 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 easy to let the acting not give the acting enough credit actually um like the performances and stuff is is actually like super phenomenal and the, the way that it works with the story and then and then the prosthetics and the makeup and shit like that is just like the icing on top of it all really but people tend to look at that as the main spectacle mm -hmm. and i think that's what they did with the prequel they tried to make it all about the the monsters and, and, the, and the effects i guess one thing i read that might interest you about that in that remake pretty well i can't remember what it was was that it, uh, apparently the producers wanted it to be initially like they did want it to be practical like the original like sorry the 1982 version but the director apparently objected to it because it would be too much like an 80s movie he says or something along those lines which is quite funny given maybe he's mistaking the 1982 <laughs> version for the Howard Hawks version that came before. Who knows? <laughs> I've heard. I've not actually read into this or anything. Um, I have seen a video on YouTube where it has all these practical effects, um, like behind the scenes stuff. I believe didn't make it into the film. Um, yeah, it'd be quite intriguing to have seen a different version of the film with practical effects, but. I do, you know, I do have a problem with uh, CGI in horror films, especially like that, because, again, you don't feel like there's any, there's anything at stake. Like, you can tell you're watching, like, just like I said with The Terminator, when you could see it was a stop-motion puppet, it's like instantly you can see it's not present on set with the actors, you can tell immediately it's a cartoon. Therefore, you don't feel any threat against the characters. And I feel like that's the problem with CGI is that it's, yeah, there's just no, there's no, there's nothing at stake. Mm -hmm. And uh, one other anecdote, if you don't remember me ask, it, it, it reminds us of like when one of my parents told me about when they went to go see Jaws back in 75. The, uh, apparently the, all the audience laughed when the shark showed up because they could tell it was a puppet <laughs> apparently but um, on the stuff about CG and modern horror uh, what do you feel about the current sort of trends of modern horror like on the one and there's a lot of people hailing sort of the rise of indie horror A24 and all that sort of stuff and in the other there's a lot of people complaining about say some of the more mainstream stuff especially with some of the remakes that have been coming out since like the turn of the century and so, so what do you think of the modern horror situation if you don't mind me asking um, I'll be really honest. I've not been watching a lot of cinema this last five years. Um, I try and watch, I try and catch a film whenever I can. Um, usually through recommendations and what have you. Um, but I have seen some really impressive films. Um, you mentioned a 24, uh, I was really, really impressed with her hereditary. Um, I've not been, to be honest, I've not been that blown away by a horror film in about 10 or 20 years. I don't know. Um, it really like, it really got me re, re excited for cinema again. Um, I've got a lot of admiration for Ari Asker and I'm looking forward to seeing his next films. Um, I saw, I actually saw Halloween, the last Halloween film. Yeah, the 2018 out, one. Yeah. And again, I was really, I was really, I was impressed with that. I thought it was really good. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing the new one that's coming out, Halloween Kills. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I've not actually seen that many bad I haven't seen that many bad horror films, but I don't know if that's because I'm not watching as much films these days. I don't know. 
I don't know. But, um, then again, you've probably seen a lot more interesting stuff than I have because the last horror film that really, you know, made me unnerved was the Grudge remake. But then again, maybe my taste isn't particularly good. I must admit. But um, on that sort of a topic, exactly. So, what is it about? If you don't mind me asking, the film stuff like Hereditary that really intrigues you and goes for the gut. If you don't mind me asking, I think it's the acting. Um, I'm really into the performances in films and the acting can really, really like make you believe in what you're watching. Um, and yeah, I, I really, the, the performances in Hereditary just really captivated me and I've, I've really appreciated the way the filmmaker allowed that to happen as well. And uh, on that, if you don't mind me asking, it's like, uh, what other modern horrors do you think are out there that are really good, if you don't mind me asking? You talked about that, Hereditary, you talked about Halloween 2018. Is there anything in, like, this last, say, five, ten, sorry, maybe not for the last five years, but slightly before that, in the last, in, during the 2010s decade, for example, that you thought was really quite, w- was worth watching, or if you don't mind me asking? Oh, um, have I actually seen any horror films in this last year? I don't think I have. Um, seen seen some pretty awful stuff on Amazon Prime from time to time. I watched this one with uh, Gerard Butler, where the comets are crashing on Earth. Ge- Ge- Geostorm is that? It? Oh, I can't remember what it's called. He's not like he gets to run away with his family, um, and that is my least favourite kind of film, whatever that kind of film is. It's just, I can't believe, I don't know, it's just so bad, really bad. I think that what you're talking about is like Geostorm, and I remember when that came out, like it was marketed, like the posters were were in like exception, inception light, because they had the same sort of font and the same sort of, um, they had essentially one of the posters, they just rearranged it slightly so people would be fooled, I guess, which is weird because Inception came out a little bit before that, but. I don't know. Or well, maybe I forget of a different one. I can't remember. It was something like that. Um, it sounds about right, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what do you think about, like, say, modern cinema in general, then, if you don't mind me asking? Because it seems like there's, you know, it doesn't seem like cinema interests you much, at least modern cinema anyway. So what do you think might be going wrong with the current movie industry, if, by the way you're making it sound, or am I misinterpreting in that? Um... Like I said, I can't really make a judgment call here because I've not watched the right lot of films. Um, um, my problem with cinema in general these days is just um, it's not it's just not a fun experience anymore. Like you go you go to the multiplex and you sit in these awful seats and you sat with awful people. And the, well, not, you know, that's about one time out of 10, you sat with awful people. And then you sat watching this cinema screen, which it's this, the TV that I have at home is better than the cinema screen. And it makes me, and it's got to the point now where I just, if there's a film that I really want to go see, I'll wait till it comes out on video and then I'll buy the video and then watch it at home. Um, just because I know that I'm going to be alone and I'm going to have this nice quality. And that's really sad, you know. Um, I'm really I'm really into film, um, projected film. I'd, mm. I'd, I'd totally go to the next town over to go see a film projected if it's, if, you know, it's it, it, seeing a film projected is just so different. So, like... It's nothing like I hate this digital stuff. I feel mm. like it's such a such a rip off that they can that they can do that. Um, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Like cinema, I just feel like it's all become not very exciting anymore because mm. you've got like HBO Max and things premiering on Disney Plus at the same time that it's out in the cinema. And you you lose that exclusivity almost instantly, and it's like the the lines of the line of TV and film 
it's just getting really blurred now. Like there's not much difference between watching like Game of Thrones and Avengers or whatever. It's all the same shit. Um, yeah, it's just it's one of them. It's one of them. It's time. The times have changed, and it makes me feel really, really. It makes me question my own career because I've always wanted to be a film director, and now this is the way things are. I'm just a bit like, well, I don't know what I want to be anymore because film. I feel like film isn't a thing anymore. So, well, not like an art form. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. No, no, no. Yeah, you're gone. Yeah, so, so it's like, like it's not necessarily more of an art form anymore it's more like a commercial enterprise is that what you're saying or am i misinterpreting that yeah it's just it's just yeah like the the prestigiousness of it all is just the integrity of it it's just all it's it's really it's really difficult now to enjoy it doesn't doesn't have the same sort of excitement as it as it once did Mm -hmm. And uh, one for, um, before I ask you the next question, a quick anecdote. Um, if you ever come down to London again, if you ever do come down to London, I'm not sure. The Prince of Chelsea one was very nice projections. I saw Susan Kane there the other day, which was very nice. And I'm going to see David Cronenberg's crash there on Thursday, which should be interesting. And uh, <laughs> have you seen it? I've seen Crash, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm a big, yeah. I'm a big David Cronenberg fan. Mm. I really like Scammers on my, my end anyway. And uh, what was it? Um... Speak. One thing I want to ask you is, like, do you think that in response to sort of like maybe disillu- occasional disillusionment with sort of mainstream cinema, do you think like foreign cinema might have sort of like a reemergence in popularity among some of the Western countries, for example? Because you saw the success of, say, Parasite last year. Uh, one of the things you did uh, was uh, homage to the raid, which was quite big when that came out. Do you think we'll see sort of like a increase in popularity in foreign cinema in the West? Do you think because of some of the things you talked about? Uh, I don't know. I really don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm always quite intrigued with the Cannes Film Festival. I'm, I'm, I was, I'm always quite uh, eager to see French cinema more than anything, personally. Um, um, I just feel like they're still kind of holding on to cinema a little bit more than other countries at the moment. And uh, what, who's your favourite French filmmaker, then, if you don't mind me asking? Favourite what, sorry? French filmmaker. Oh, um, at the moment, Gaspar No. All right. Sort of like, uh, what makes, uh, what sort of stuff do you like about his films, then? Because I know who you're talking about, obviously, the director of Irreversible, uh, Mentor the Void, and more recently, Love, if I'm not mistaken. I know he did another one, but I can't remember what it's called. What do you like about his films, then, if you don't mind me asking, given how controversial they are in some circles? Um, I just find him really intriguing um, as a filmmaker, but his films, they... You can, you can tell there's a lot of passion. Um, they're being made with a lot of passion. You can see that he really cares about the audience and the and the experience and and every time I, I always feel I always feel like I have experienced something pretty 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 life changing actually when I watch his films. Um, I never feel the same after watching one of his films. <laughs> That's for fucking sure. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite of his films? That if you don't mind me asking. Oof, I, it's, it's a tough one. I can't say that. I would never say, oh, watch this Gaspar No film. Do you <laughs> know what I mean? Uh, this is my favorite Gaspar No film. I can tell you, like, I watched this Gaspar No film and it disturbed me for like three years. Um, I found, to be honest, I found Love 3D. I saw, I saw Love 3D in the cinema with the, with the 3D glasses and everything. Mm-hmm. And that was so wow! That was just so incredible, with the free like the three D aspect of it and everything. And I don't know, I don't know why, but it just it was so it was haunting, absolutely haunting. Um, there's just there's not there's not many films that like do that to me. 
Um, and so for that, I just, I find him really intriguing. Um, um, one anecdote before I ask you the next question, by the way, is that, um, well, maybe just two slight ones. And well, I was in Belgium on holiday a couple of years ago, and they were actually advertising love quite a bit, like publicly, in a way I don't think would happen in England, which I found quite amusing. And another thing is, like, is Criterion Collection DVD picks videos actually quite amusing, in case you're interested in watching that. But um, the next thing I wanted to ask you is that I am an inspiring filmmaker myself. I made a short film, not as good as yours, obviously, but um, I've made, I'm planning on making some more stuff. What would you, uh, what advice would you give to aspiring filmmakers like myself, if you don't mind me asking? Um, I'd give the same advice that someone gave to me. Um, when I was a teenager, I reached out um, to a couple of the, a couple of these Australian filmmakers that had just made a film called undead mm. um i forgot what their names Sparrow are Sparrog brothers the, i think yeah yeah the ones who made a daybreakers and the jigsaw if i'm not mistaken as well from yeah those guys that's, yeah that's correct um one of them i asked him the same question like what what would you what advice would you give and this was like a moment in my life where i was like really desperate to achieve being a filmmaker and he he gave a really good, solid piece of advice, and I always repeat this to anyone else that asks me the same question. Basically, um, make make anything and everything. Like, never stop. Whatever you do, don't stop. So make commercials, make wedding videos, <laughs> make music videos, make just a little tiny video for fun, make a short film, make a feature film. Whatever you do, just don't stop. Like, don't, don't, because the more you do, the more you produce, the better you get, the more you get, you sort of like find your own voice and, and get the confidence. And, um, you know, before you know it, you sort of like, you are a filmmaker because you are making films. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. And uh, one other thing I wanted to ask you is that you were talking about making feature films earlier on. Uh, one thing that I know you started back in 2014 and I know you've uploaded stuff about it since and I was initially one of the Kickstarter pe- people who funded you on Kickstarter to get this off the ground. How is, oh, Spook, Train, how is Spook Train coming along, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, it's not. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a bit of a sad one. Basically, yeah, the Kickstarter didn't prevail and then there was loads of little hopeful moments beyond that but it never prevailed and then I tried to self-fund it um I tried to work on it three months a year with the intention of doing that over the course of 10 years Mm. and then by by the end of it had been the year 2025 actually because I started in 2015 I would have had the whole film made. So if I'd have continued making it, I'd have just been over the halfway point by this year, 2021. Mm. Um, so I made the first segment in, 20, in 2015 and I made the second segment in 2016. And then 2017, 2018, those years came and went and I wasn't, I wasn't doing it because I was, um, I was, I was getting, I got myself into debt. And I was neat. I had to. I had to make do job jobs to keep my business in the in the green. Um, and then by 2019, I just I think it was 2018 actually. By the end of 2018 or 2019, I can't remember. I just the burden of 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 the whole Spook Train project just it was too much for me. And I and then I just I decided to put them onto YouTube one year at a time. So I put the first segment on YouTube for Halloween and then I put the second one on YouTube. And I thought, I just couldn't, I just couldn't first keeping it on ice mm. and then and then hoping to have a film by the end of it. I just thought, well, uh, yeah, I'll put them on YouTube. And if, if they do, I don't know, maybe some of it might come off it. I don't know. Mm. I was feeling like I was disowning my whole, my whole YouTube audience which i felt was was the wrong thing to do because it was you it was by putting content onto youtube that in return 
gave me a career uh, in making music videos and commercials. Um, so I felt like it would be uh, better as, as, a, as a business aspect as well to put it onto YouTube because I was like, hope maybe I'll get more work if I put it onto YouTube. Um, so yeah, maybe one day I'll do another segment, but it's not it's not a thing anymore, really. Mm-hmm. At least you started and tried it, I guess, which is at least something. You might get some stuff off the ground if you don't want me saying. So at least there's that if you don't want me saying. So at least you've got something out of it. One, yeah. um, I'm sorry. That's okay. I mean, yeah, I mean, I give it, I give it a go. I give it my best shot. That's and um, yeah, it it was quite it was quite a interesting project to tackle as well because it felt a lot different to just a normal YouTube video. Like I was, I was approaching it from a, a perspective that it was going to be on a cinema screen and it was going to be enjoyed as a movie. And it is quite a different beast to just like a normal video that goes onto YouTube. It has more of like a cinematic feel to it. And, and I, and I learned, I learned quite a lot from doing them segments. So yeah, it was, it was, it was good. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I'm um, myself working on a very cheap feature film, and I'll probably get no get. I won't get probably anywhere near as far as you. But I'm going to try it anyway. But uh, one other thing I want to ask you: two small questions before the main stuff at the, near the end, because we're getting up to our hour. Um, do you ever get recognised on the street for your uh, work and so on? If you don't mind me asking, do you ever get like face recognised or whatever, or is it just being anonymous <laughs> because of the field you're in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. I mean, I do get. I have been recognised a few times. Um, I've had, I'm actually friends with a guy um, locally that recognised me in Morrison's, <laughs> um, and that 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 really scared me. Um, <laughs> and then I kept bumping into him, and then I thought, oh, you know what? Like, I'm just gonna go with this. Let's just be friends. Um, I was once. I was once walking up these mountains in uh, Yorkshire, mm. uh, the Yorkshire, the Yorkshire Free Peaks. Um, I was on the top of one, and this guy, like, I just walked past this guy, and he like stopped me, and he was like, "Hey, are you that guy that does the stop motion animations?" And it's just like, I don't get recognized. Like, I must get recognized about, I'd say about twice a year, <laughs> but every time, every time it happens, it like really like rocks me a little bit I'm like well yeah and uh the final thing i wanted to ask you before the uh, the last two questions was that what sort of stuff are you working on now if you don't mind me asking like what's your main focus on if you don't mind me asking um this year has been very intense um i've i've got a music video shot it's just going through the vfx process which might take a little bit of time um it's a collaboration with another director called Ian Pond Jules. Mm-hmm. Um, it's quite an interesting project, slightly different to my my usual ones. Um, that I don't know when that's coming out, but that's all some of that I did at the start of the year. Then I've been doing loads of work for Adult Swim. Um, mm-hmm. I've been making loads of these Rick and Morty bumps, like about 15 seconds long. I've made about 10 of them. And they're slowly being coming out as the new season's been showing. And then um, they've actually asked me to make a short film of Adult Swim for Rick, for Rick and Morty. Yeah. So it's like it's like a like a spin-off episode, like a standalone Rick and Morty episode. It's going to be about it'll be about eight or ten minutes long. Um, I'm shooting that at the moment, and that's quite exciting. It's quite it's a bit like a bit like a spook train, like a Rick and Morty spook train. <laughs> uh, good luck to you on that, if you don't mind me saying. And uh, what are the the penultimate question I wanted to ask you, and this is the title of the show, and I ask all my guests who come on it, is what would your ideal world be? My ideal world. Um, my ideal world would be sun, surf, beach. Um, Lots of nature, lots of animals eating people. Um, no, no viruses. Um, but you know what? The reality is, we need we need 
we we need uh we need pain and suffering because that's what life's about. Mm-hmm. I was about to say, um, so your idea will we'll be cool with them until I heard the animals eating people, which I figured they don't have many down there, but maybe they do. I don't know. And uh, the, okay, thank you for coming on, and uh, thank you for um tolerating some of the technical glitches on my end. But one f- final thing I did want to ask is that uh, for anyone who wants to find your work or wants to find out more about yourself, where can they go? What social media sites can they go on and yeah, what all that jazz? What can how can they find you? Uh, if you search for my name, uh, Lee Hardcastle, you'll find that I've got a YouTube account, I've got a Twitch account, and I've got an Instagram account, and that's that's as far as I am on on, on the internet. Okay, thank you for coming on today, and uh, thank you for taking part. You're welcome. Thank you very bye-bye. much for inviting me on. That's bye. Right, bye. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this podcast, please like and share this video, as well as subscribe to the Edward Ed Interviews YouTube channel, and also the Ed Interviews BitChute channel, and also look at my stuff on Mixcloud as well. I have more of this content coming in, and also subscribe to my Patreon subscribe store as well for more guests requests, as well as free covers of my old books. Until then, see you next time, guys.